Hello, my name is Adam Rosen. I'm an orthopedic surgeon in Southern California who specializes in joint replacement. And although it's not as important as the ongoing pandemic affecting our world, uh, education is still an important part of medicine. And I know that like our fellows, lots of fellows and orthopedic residents around the country right now have had their education turned upside down. This is actually a lecture that I was planning on presenting in Las Vegas in April, and that meeting, like lots of meetings, has been canceled. So what I've tried to do here is put together a short lecture uh, based on that longer lecture that I was planning on giving uh, in the hopes that you can sit back and watch this and learn a little bit about this. My hope is that I can start to go back through some of my older lectures and publish more of these online, not knowing how long this pandemic is going to go on for and how that may affect the education of our residents and fellows uh, in the upcoming weeks. So when I talk about alignment and total knee replacement, it's really a broad term because we can talk about the actual alignment radiographically. But what a lot of people come to realize is that even a knee that's perfectly aligned radiographically may not always result in a painless knee. We know that 15-20% of patients that have otherwise successful knee replacements are unhappy with the result. And the big question that we still don't have a clear answer to is why. So what I'm going to try to do here is I'm not going to try to go into a lot of detail on the historical studies. You can go back and read those at your leisure. And I'm not going to try to give you a cookie cutter step-by-step -step way of doing a knee replacement because you can read that in the techniques manual. What I'm hoping to put across to you today is a lot of critical thinking. As I go through a knee replacement with our fellows, I try as best as I can to let them know what my brain is thinking. Everything that we do has a potential outcome down the road. And what I'm going to try to do today is to point out some of those things that I think about each case so that the next time you do a knee replacement, you more critically assess what you're doing and what effect that may have on the steps down the road. I like to use the analogy that knee replacements are very similar to the old choose your own adventure books. And if you don't remember what those books are, then I'm really dating myself here. But these were the books that you could read through a billion times. And every single time you got to the end of a page, it would give you a couple options and that would tell you which page to turn to. So for example, when you're doing a knee replacement, there's a lot of times people will say, oh, they have a flexion contracture. Take two more off the distal femur. Well, that's great if the extension gap was going to be tight. However, if their flexion contracture was due to an osteophyte in the back of the knee, and now you cut two more millimeters, and then later on in the case, remove that large osteophyte, now you've increased that extension gap. And now you might have a mismatch between your flexion and extension gaps. So the question is, if you're thinking ahead and your flexion gap now is too tight, are you able to anteriorize and decrease your femoral size to balance the gaps? So just remember that every single time that we do something along the way, that may have an effect on the outcome at the end of the case. The other thing that I like people to think about is the personality of the knee. A lot of times we talk about the personality of the fracture. And in knee replacement, you can really look at the x-rays and get an idea of the personality of the knee. Is the patient in varus or valgus? And if they're in valgus, the last thing you want to do is a large medial release like you would for a varus knee. Also, what is their posterior condylar offset like? There are some people, I tend to see it more commonly in men, that have a large posterior condylar offset. So if you downsize the femoral component incorrectly, you can significantly increase the flexion gap. And then also Baja and Alta. The question is, if you have a significant Baja, how difficult is it going to be to expose that knee? Or if someone has an Alta from some prior ligamentous tear and surgery, the question is, do you need to elevate the joint line to restore kinematics? The other thing to always think about, too, is the rollback. If you look at the tibiofemoral offset, this is something that you can measure with a caliper. And if you're looking to try to restore kinematics, you want to make sure that their offset is appropriate for the patient and that you try not to narrowly place everybody into the same category with the outcome of your knee replacement at the end of the procedure. So with a knee replacement, we want to restore the mechanical axis of the limb. But the question there remains is, 
what was the person's alignment prior to the development of knee arthritis? We've all seen and heard about these patients that get left in what we would consider gentleman's varus. So when looking at the x-ray, you might criticize the x-ray by saying that it was left in varus. And these are the patients that feel great and are thankful that they had such a good outcome. And at other times, you may have someone in slight varus or valgus that you correct to normal. So their mechanical axis is perfect radiographically, yet they still don't have the pain relief that you would expect. There are lots of different ways of looking at alignment and total knee replacements, and each surgeon may have his own philosophy on how he likes to address his total knee replacement patients. I really do try to take into account both their mechanical and anatomic alignment, as well as their slope when you're recreating the tibial cut based on the implant design that you choose, keeping all of those things in mind and making subtle changes based on the anatomy and the patient, in my mind, may help obtain a more balanced and more painless knee at the end of the case. When we perform total knee replacements, there's lots of things that we can use to assess both the alignment and balancing. There's different ways to use intramedullary and extramedullary, as well as the different technological devices that we have. We all know that we treat varus and valgus knees differently. You can do a true gap balancing type of knee or measured resection. And there's lots of articles, instructional course lectures and chapters on how to do a ligament release. Do you do it in order sequentially, or do you go after just what's tight? And even anatomic landmarks, studies have been done that showed how good or bad we are at identifying the epicondyles. But the important thing to remember at the end of the day is a normal knee is not the same as a normal total knee. I think one of the important things to do before you even start a case is start to recognize where all the places are along the path that you can screw up the alignment or balancing. Even something as simple as just creating the hole in the bone, if performed incorrectly, can affect the alignment of the rod and the jig and the knee replacement. And we've all heard the term about garbage in and garbage out with navigation. Even something as simple as pinning the block can cause deflections in the jig which can ultimately alter the alignment of your cuts and the overall alignment and balancing of your knee replacement. We've all seen that the saw can create certain tendencies in individuals. I noticed that with certain right-handed or left-handed individuals, that as they cut across the table, sometimes the weight of the battery will deflect and they may have a tendency to cut particular knees into varus or valgus. Something as simple as punching the tibia which people believe you can just hit it and flatten it. If you ever notice as you punch the tibia, if your fin starts to go easy into the softer bone on one side, but gets hung up on the other side due to sclerotic bone, and you keep hitting it harder, you may compress that other side that has the softer bone, which can ultimately affect the alignment of your tibia and the overall alignment of your knee replacement. Even cementing the implant can be to your advantage or disadvantage. I find sometimes, even with one millimeter polys, you may find that you want to be a half a millimeter, in which case those are knees that you can cement with a little extra cement and maybe gain a half a millimeter of space behind the implant. The other option, which can cause a negative outcome, would be if you hit the implant as hard as you can. Once again, this is more common in softer bone, and as you impact the implant hard, you can affect the overall valgus or varus alignment of the knee, as well as how you hold the knee in its final position while the cement is hardening or curing. Although it's generally believed that IM is more accurate than EM when it comes to the femur, you can still mess up the alignment by creating the entry hole in the wrong position. And there are times, due to retained hardware or prior deformity, where an intramedullary alignment rod is not able to be used. This was an interesting article that looked at the idea of either using a fixed angle distal femoral cut for varus or valgus knees or making it variable based on the patient's anatomy. I keep this in mind, especially when I'm dealing with very tall or very short patients, and I try to get long length films ahead of time, and may customize by changing the distal femoral cutting angle a degree or so based on their alignment and their deformity, and I find that this helps my balancing at the end of the case. We talked before about how important it is 
regarding where the entry hole is placed. And this little diagram I put together helps explain that. So if you look at the x-rays, and you can define exactly where the anatomic axis is to the tibia, and make your hole in line with that, you're more likely to have an accurate tibial cut based on the intramedullary alignment guide. However, if you place your hole too medial or lateral, depending on which knee you're working on, this could create a varus or valgus cut based on the alignment jig. And the same holds true for being too far anterior or posterior. If you're too far anterior and the guide gets kicked, it's going to create anterior slope. In addition to hole placement, if you're using intramedullary or whether or not you're using intramedullary or extramedullary, the rotation of the cutting guide is important also. We did a recent CAD study that looked at the change in varus valgus malalignment based on how you made your cut based on the rotation of the cutting guide. And this is ever more important now with some newer knee designs that are recommending seven degrees of posterior slope for cruciate retaining total knee replacements. And although my common default is intramedullary alignment jigs, there are times where intramedullary alignment jigs just don't work. So I did my first navigated knee around 2005. And like any new technology, there's always a learning curve. There are lots of studies that have shown that it can improve your alignment, but just as much there's been some other studies that have questioned that conclusion that a navigated knee can increase both alignment as well as longevity of a total knee replacement. And for anybody that's done a navigated knee, you know that it does take some additional time to place your pins and place your trackers, and although the technology has improved, there are still some nuances that are different than doing a knee replacement without navigation. And although I commonly use intramedullary devices now, I still default back to nav if I have a complicated case from prior deformity or retained hardware. But I think the biggest thing that I took away from using navigation in the beginning was it really taught me that you have to be accurate in pinning the block, in cutting with the saw, and cementing. Because when you reference these, you can start to realize that each one of these things can add a degree or two of deflection in the overall outcome of your total knee replacement. The other thing that I learned from navigation is that although you can have a perfectly aligned knee on x-ray, that not all of those patients are pain-free. Now there is lots of different other options out there as far as technology goes. That in of itself is an entire symposium and I leave it up to you to research those and to train in those and decide which things are useful for you based on your particular patients. You can talk a lot about the overall alignment and the bone cuts, but an even more important aspect of total knee replacements in my opinion is the actual balancing. And we still don't truly understand whether or not you should leave a knee tight or loose. You'll meet surgeons that prefer a loose knee and other ones that prefer a tight knee. I tend to examine patients' other knee if they're normal, or especially if the other knee's already been replaced and they like it. If it gives you the option of a tighter knee and you're between two sizes of a polyethylene insert, you may choose to err on the tighter one for that patient. Versus a patient that loves their loose knee, I find that if you put those patients in too tight, they may have more pain. The other issue that we talk about a lot of times also is the flexion extension gaps and whether or not they're balanced or unbalanced. And most people by now have memorized what they do in each individual circumstance. The harder part is what about mid flexion and what about rotation? Is there a structure in the posterior medial or posterior lateral corner that could be tight? And if you release that, does that aid in the normal kinematics of the knee to make the knee more functional or less painful? Also, since the beginning of time, the old uh, which came first, the chicken or the egg debate, that will probably go on as long as the debate between cruciate retaining and posterior stabilized. But you always want to keep some other little tricks up your sleeve. There are times in an extremely tight varus knee medially where you may choose to downside the tibial component and resect some of the medial bone. Also in cruciate retaining knees, the idea of PCL recession, there's lots of different techniques that have been described as far as pie crusting and releases, as well as removing some of the anterior bone on the posterior aspect of the tibia to let the PCL lay flat. The other thing which I find a lot of people aren't aware of, a little trick in case you're a little tight in extension but well balanced in flexion, is you can remove some of the slope. The saw should exit above the bone in the back 
and you should be taking a little bone off the front of the tibia. And what this does in essence is open up your extension gap a millimeter or so while retaining the flexion balancing. So my current protocol for the femur is I'll use an intramedullary alignment rod. Once I do make my cut, I use the jig to add it as a second way of rechecking the cut to make sure that that block or the saw hasn't deflected what I was aiming to achieve. And if they have a severe deformity or retained hardware, I'll either use ortho align or navigation. On the tibial side, I'll use intramedullary commonly, and I'll recheck with a flatness assessor to once again reassess my cut. If they have a severe deformity or if the canal is really tight, I may defer to using an extramedullary guide or potentially an ortho align device. As far as balancing, I tend to be a minimal releaser in the beginning on my approach, and I find that I can release later if necessary. Once I've made my cuts, I'll take the knee through a range of motion, and I occasionally will use lamina spreaders medially and laterally to check both the flexion and extension gap, or if you have access to a tensioner, you can use this as well in select cases. The other little trick that I found to be really helpful is using a homin right over the middle of the polyethylene trial, and by picking this up, you can see if it lifts equally or if it lifts asymmetrically to determine whether or not you're tight on the medial or lateral side. I predominantly do cruciate retaining knees at this time. And what I find is at the end of the case, if it's a little tight, what I tend to do is a little recession, most commonly off the tibia, not the femur. I always assess as to whether or not I need to introduce more slope as I try to match the patient's natural slope when I make my initial cut. Occasionally I'll take a needle and we can do a little pie cresting. I find this to be especially useful if you have one particular band that's tight versus the entire PCL being tight. And there are instances intraoperatively where I find that the flexion gap is so tight based on the patient's anatomy or deformity that I'll intraoperatively transition to a posterior stabilized design. And like I said before, I typically use intramedullary, but there are times when I do need to navigate based on a particular deformity or with retained hardware. One extra pearl that I'll throw out there now, we're currently in the process of studying it. I've been doing this for a number of years, and now we're actually randomizing and doing a study at our institution. What I found to be one of the simplest, probably cheapest, and easiest ways, in my opinion, to help patients get more motion is to take an intraoperative picture. So at the end of the case, when the dressings are on, I will lift the leg up and flex the knee and take a picture. I give this photograph to the patients the following morning on rounds. And what I let them know is this picture just lets them know that when they bend their knee and they feel pain, that it is okay to keep pushing and they're not gonna hurt or damage the knee. Interestingly, when I started doing this, my nurse recognized that almost all calls from patients regarding their knee being stiff stopped. The other thing that I noticed is that most of my patients obtained flexion earlier, and I believe that patients that obtain early range of motion all tend to have both a shortened recovery period and overall less pain. The study that we're doing currently will help actually determine whether or not there is a statistically significant difference in patients' postoperative range of motion if they get a picture or do not. I hope you've found this information useful and helpful. We're in very unique times now, and I'm not sure anybody truly knows exactly when we're going to get back into the hospitals for routine education and elective surgeries. I'm going to try to go back through my archives and look back at other lectures that I've given over the years and try to narrow them down in this format so it's something that you can access and continue your education. Any questions, feel free to contact me. I'll do my best to try to answer them. And in the meantime, everybody, stay safe, be healthy, take care and I'll talk to you next time. Thanks for listening. <music>